So now that I've finally gotten around to seeing all 10 of the movies that were nominated for Best Picture at this year's Oscars, which was broadcast just a couple of days ago, I'm going to rank them all worst to best. Here goes. Number 10 is Poor Things. This is an example, as with a few other of your Ghost Land Thymos's movies, uh, where what is on display is a brilliantly technically crafted movie you know it looks amazing the production design is amazing the performances are all great but i just didn't like it i i don't care for the subject matter i think there's an interesting story there but i just don't like where it goes i don't like the journey it takes me on and by the time i get to the end of it i'm not really sure what it was all about because it throws so many ideas at you that by the time you get to the end, you're kind of lost in this cacophony of ideas where nothing really solidifies. So, yeah, for me, not a fun film to watch. And a film doesn't have to be fun. I know I've said that before and people misinterpret what I say. I don't expect all films to be fun, but I expect the ride that it takes me on to be something that challenges me in a way that brings me new understanding or makes me look at the world in a different way even if it was a depressing hellhole of a film does it challenge me in that way and this didn't really i just found a lot of the things in it that challenged me challenged me because i just didn't want to see them uh, so yeah not a great best picture nominee for me personally but number nine is maestro and this is a film that really does try to tick all the boxes when it comes to Oscars and, and voting and whatnot but in the end it just feels like a generic biopic that I don't kind of agree with most of its philosophies on life I, I feel like this is a great companion piece I said this in my review to past lives this is a great companion piece to past lives I feel like they both deal with a lot of the same issues it's just that this one airs on the side of how not to do them, even though it presents it as like, oh, you can't do anything about it, that's just life, love is love and all that nonsense. Uh, whereas I think, yeah, Past Lives did a lot, a much better job, fell more on the side I can agree with, which is that actually uh, love is about making a choice and, and, and upholding that choice, upholding your principles in accordance with that choice. So yeah, for me, Maestro, good performances, Really beautiful cinematography, all that kind of jazz. Again, a, a technically well-crafted movie, but just a little bit laborious to watch, a bit boring in places, and I didn't really care for the central relationships as much as I should in order to go on the journey that they were asking me to go on. The number eight for me is Barbie. This is a film that I found very entertaining. Watched it with my wife. We both kind of got a lot out of it, really enjoyed it. But I did feel like I was being preached to a lot. I felt like it was very left-leaning right until the end. And then it kind of pulls this little switcheroo at the end that makes you think, oh, was that, was that kind of a send-up of, of leftist ideology? And then really we've kind of ended on this right, right note. And it's just, so it's just like I'm left thinking, okay, is, is this just the director trying to have the cake and eat it? Are they trying to please everybody or was that just a concession that was made at the end and it's, it's hard to tell and because of that I, I feel like the film has conflicting ideologies and I'm never quite sure where the filmmaker is really leaning not you know completely so so yeah I was entertained by it I thought Ryan Gosling was great it was quite amusing seeing him be the one to get nominated for the Oscar in this big feminist movie, but uh, yeah, well deserved. He was the most entertaining thing about it. On a technical level, it's very good. It's very nice to look at, but essentially, you know, when, when you've got a studio movie like this and you've got all the money to throw around, you, you can build a huge Barbie set. You know, you, it's like, okay, but I, I feel like there are other movies that, did things where they're in much harsher conditions, maybe didn't have the amount of control over the environment that, say, the filmmakers of this did, and therefore, personally, I think, went overlooked when it came to the Best Picture nominee category. Uh, yeah, there's plenty of films I would have put in that category over this one. But as I say, 
I found it entertaining and I think possibly on a second viewing my opinion might go up a bit, might go down, who knows, but uh, yeah, there's things I've, I've read about it since watching it where it makes me think, you know, I, I wouldn't mind checking it out again just, just to see if that's in there, just to see if what they're saying is really in there and maybe there's certain things that I overlooked first time around. But but for now, I, I do have to say that I don't think it should have been in the running for best picture. Number seven for me is The Zone of Interest. I know a lot of people who think this movie is amazing. I thought it was very well made indeed. Got amazing cinematography on it. I think the, the use of sound and just the fact that we we get a true sense, a true picture of, of evil in its truest form without ever seeing the acts that they commit. It's, it's just their attitude to it, their ambivalence towards what they are doing. Um, I personally think that this is an amazing kind of half hour film stretched out into a feature. I feel like once you get the point, then you get the point. And from then on out, it's just kind of hammered over the head to, to you. So yeah, for me, didn't need to be a feature, didn't need to be as long as it was, but it is definitely an interesting film that is very well directed, very well shot, and very well acted. And number six for me is American Fiction, uh, one of the funniest films of last year. Uh, the, the, the two funniest films both appear on this list, uh, in, in fact, which is quite remarkable for me because I'm not generally the comedy guy, but I do like comedy dramas, and this is one. Um, now, this kind of leans the other way to Barbie, so whereas Barbie kind of was a film with a, a, a real left-leaning ideology that did a switcheroo at the end and kind of went right all of a sudden. Uh, this is a film that leans heavily into a right ideology for the first half before kind of descending down a tunnel of left ideology uh, in the second half. Again, that kind of leaves me in a position of thinking, well, okay, what, what are you doing? Are you trying to appeal to both sides or are you literally using the the momentum of, of what you've built in the first half to to pull down the right and say that hey look your ideologies may seem nice on the surface you may feel like you're right but in fact you're wrong uh, and that's kind of what it feels like in the end so from the political side of things i'm not quite on board with everything the film has to say but it does such a good job in saying it uh, with regards to how funny it is how humorous it is that I kind of overlook a lot of those failings uh, because, again, like I say, it's just really funny. Uh, Jeffrey Wright steals the show in the lead performance, but Stephen K. Brown is also very good in a supporting role. So the performances across the board are very good. Uh, I think, the, the, again, like I say, the humour, I laughed more than a dozen times uh, throughout and a proper laugh, not just a, a little chuckle. And, and I really warmed to, well, particularly to the central character. Number five is Killers of the Flower Moon, the latest Scorsese film, Martin Scorsese film. Um, I really liked this film. I would give it a four and a half out of five, so that tells you how much I like it. The reason I'm not quite willing to go that full five is because, again, I feel like this is a movie that is much longer than it needs to be. I feel like it's a little bit self-indulgent of Scorsese to, to go the length that he goes to. Other than that slightly self-indulgent running time, I do think the film is very well made. Now, most of the films in this, well, all of them, I guess, do to, to some degree because they have to. They, they, they tick certain boxes. You know, a couple of years ago, the Academy changed their criteria for what could be nominated for a best picture and that's why a lot of the films you get on the list deal with certain issues or you know like have certain yeah boxes ticked shall we say get political to, to a certain degree uh, and while that really doesn't work for me in a lot of cases this is one of the cases where it does I feel like this film could have been made in any era it doesn't feel like it's been made just to tick boxes. It just so happens that it does. Uh, it, it, that's just that's just a, a side benefit of the of the fact that this is a story that is worth telling that should have been told many years ago. You know, this feels like an updated version of a film like Cimarron, which won the Best Picture back in what nineteen thirty three or something like that. Um, but yeah, thirty uh, one. So 
yeah, I, I feel like it is a story that needed to be told, that is worth telling, uh, maybe not at the length that it gets told. Uh, just because, like, there's only so many times you can see DiCaprio's character and his cronies kind of killing someone, assassinating someone or doing dirty on someone before you just kind of like, OK, yeah, we, we get it. We, we we know what we know what we did. We shouldn't have done it, um, and 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 that's that. I do think the performances again across the board are really very good. I'm not quite so sure I would have said that Lily Gladstone gives the, the the most amazing performance that she seems to be getting given credit for. I do feel like a lot of that talk is political, is down to the fact that this is a, a Native American performance in a film about the Native Americans, so we want to give them the due. Uh, you know, that's not to say it's a bad performance, it's just that there are quite a few other performances from last year that, that move me more, I think, than, than, than essentially this performance of, of a woman that, for, for the most part, is, is laying in bed, kind of getting a bit doolally. I did also really like the score for this film. I thought it was one of the best scores of last year and I'm glad it got a nomination. Number four is Anatomy of a Fall, a really great film that dissects a possible murder case. We don't know, we don't get the answer. I mean, uh, it's just, yeah, we, we, we get given a verdict, but we're always left wondering, okay, did she, didn't she? And that's one of the beauties of the film. That's really what it's all about because it calls into question the judicial system itself. There's things in the film that I really related to, like there's one particular section when this so-called expert asks the question, why would this man who, you know, why, why would he kill it? The guy who may have killed himself, may have been murdered, we don't know at this point, and it's just like, why would he uh, say that he's gonna wean himself off his antidepressants only to then just go cold turkey on him? And it, that's almost like a smoking gun as far as he's concerned. Um, but when I when I watched that sequence, I was sat there going, oh, hello, I did that. I, I did that. I, I, you know, I told my doctor I wanted to wean myself off the tablets and then literally the day later, I just went cold turkey. Uh, I, I, I'm not entirely sure of the psychology behind that myself, but I just know that I did it. So to see it in this film where it becomes this hard piece of evidence, it really just, it puts things into perspective, the way things can be manipulated, the way things that can be used in court. Um, and it, it does throw into question any verdict, I guess, that is made. Uh, and, and the truth is we, we just don't know. You know, for those of us that don't get to see what goes on in the courtroom, we only hear the verdict. Uh, most of us get to see all the public trial, you know, stuff in the media. Uh, before the and, and never the stuff that goes on in the actual courtroom and it's just yeah guilt or innocence it's a tricky thing in it just, it, it certain cases we might never know uh and, and that may even be most cases but yeah it just the film deals with all that in such a powerful way a gripping way it's just people talking in rooms or courtrooms and the whole time you're on the edge of your seat because you're just like oh right one minute you think she did it and the next minute you think she don't one minute you're rooting for her, the next minute you're like, you're not so sure. And yeah, that's that's the beauty of it. That's the power of the film. And I, I just thought it was a real amazing drama. And I thought that Sandra Huller gave a phenomenal central performance. Number three for me is Past Lives. I have reviewed this film on my channel. So if you want to know my full thoughts on it, do go and check that out. But for me, uh, yeah, as I said, this, this is... A real great companion piece uh, in this year's Oscars to Maestro. I think both films look at um, love or the idea of love and I, I lean much more heavily into the representation of it in this film. The idea that it, ultimately it's a choice, it's not led by feelings or shouldn't be led by feelings. Um, feelings are, are, are part of it, sure, but yeah, I, I, you know, what we get in this film is a picture uh, of, of a marriage that I feel is fully authentic, feels very real to me, um, and it's great to see a relationship, a marriage relationship, that uh, isn't full of drama, isn't, you know, somebody cheating on another, or, or you know, like somebody's done something nasty, or the, the partner is nasty, uh, and, and, you, and you want the, the other one to leave them, and all this, no, it's just, 
It's just a really great piece about relationships and the choices we make, the choices that are available to us versus the choices that, you know, we ultimately make. And I feel like this is a film about making the right choices and about, yeah, what what kind of people that turns us into and, and, and things like that. But I just thought it was beautifully made. It's very dreamlike. Uh, the performances in it are fantastic. They really suck me into these characters, especially Greta Lee. Um, yeah, I just, it's, it's a great film. One of the best films of last year and certainly a worthy nominee for Best Picture. Number two is The Holdovers. This is the other film on this list of nominees that I thought is one of the funniest films of last year. This and American Fiction are the two films that made me laugh more than any other film uh, of last year. I, I just thought it was a really great character study of these th essentially three characters. There are more characters in there, but there's three, ca three central characters, um, all three actors involved in those performances do a fantastic job. Um, it's, you know, it's an old story that's been told many times and will be told many times again. But for me, it's always in the execution here. It's executed great. And that story is, you know, you put a band of people together, you can find them together, you know, they, they have to spend time together for, for a certain period of time they don't really like each other to begin with and as the film goes on they grow to love each other and respect each other and and, and want to be there for each other you know it's a breakfast club you think a breakfast club you take that you do a slight twist on it boom there you go um so in that respect it's, it's not really an original idea but its execution feels very you know very timely, very original, very kind of, yeah, it's, it's just very well executed. It's the best thing that Alexander Payne has directed since Sideways. And he's directed some good films since Sideways. Um, but yeah, this this for me is, is him back on Sideways form. Um, like I say, I found it incredibly funny, incredibly moving. It was a surprise for me, to be honest. When I saw a lot of the posters, a lot of the trailers, the colour palette of the film. It looked like it was going to be a bit dank, a bit depressing, a bit slow moving, a bit like one of them artsy fartsy Hollywood type movies that all your, your art house crowd go wild for, but it's actually not that great. And no, it, it, it was as good as people said it was. Uh, and I was very pleasantly surprised. One of the best films of last year. And again, another worthy Best Picture nominee. But my number one is Oppenheimer. I'm sure that's not much of a surprise to most people. But yeah, I, I think there are a lot of films on this list that shouldn't be on it. That, uh, maybe half of the of, of the films on this list shouldn't be on it. I, I can think of a, quite a few other movies that I would have put on instead. Uh, Society of the Snow, we're looking at you. So I will, you know, I will leave my full thoughts on, on whether or not this is the best film of the year until I do my Lomax Movie Awards. But uh, certainly of these Best Picture nominees, I would say the Academy made the right choice. And I cannot honestly say when the last time that was. Um, I thought it was going to be when La La Land won. But then they came up on stage and actually took it off and gave it to Moonlight, which was my least favourite that year. So, yeah, um, it's quite indicative of how I feel most years at the Oscars. The, the one that is on the ballot that I most want to win very rarely does. Um, but this year, definitely of the 10 nominees, this was the one that I was rooting for. And boom, it got it. Incredible film. Again, mostly people talking in rooms, but you're gripped, you're hooked, because the character uh, work that is in it, the, the thematics, the, the discussions on, again, the choices we make, why we make them, and the ramifications of them uh, is, is, yeah, it's really quite profound at times. Uh, and I just think it's, it's Nolan doing what Nolan does. You know, Nolan's my favourite filmmaker, and this is just another example of why. I think he should have been not only nominated, but he should have won director many times over before now. But, you know, hey-ho, better late than never. I'm glad, I got, I'm glad he got it for a film as good as Oppenheimer is and not, you know, 20 years down the line when he's maybe not as good as he once was and they 
they give him the, the, the pity one that they do with a lot of directors. No, he's still in his prime. He's still made a, an awesome movie, one of the best of last year. And he got best director, he got best picture, and deservedly so, as far as I'm concerned. But what about you? Have you seen all 10 of the best picture nominees from 2024? And if so, how would you rank them? Also, let me know, do you think that Oppenheimer was a worthy winner or would you have gone with one of the other nominees instead? Leave your thoughts down in the comment section below. Thank you for watching this video and until next time, cracking.